Um, from John uh, chapter 10, verses 11 through 21, we have another shepherd's story. So I've been enjoying these as worship leader. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So uh, we've had a transportation issue in our church and with a, a couple other guys that were more mechanically savvy, a couple of us went out to Meskwaki just uh, last week, just last Saturday, to, to test out a bus, to check it out and see if it was worth purchasing to try to help alleviate the transportation needs that we have. And uh, so I had, it had been a couple of years since I drove a bus and I got to kind of test drive this bus. And, it, and I used to drive a bus professionally, but the bus was a stick. I've never driven a bus that was a stick. And so that was uh, quite an interesting experience. And it's not that regular configuration that you have in a car. It was like that one where like reverse is where first would be and whatever the other kind of alternate configuration is. And so it's been a long time since I've driven a vehicle that had that kind of setup. And it reminded me of this previous time in my life uh, when I was a sheet metal worker where I was trying to learn how to drive a stick. And one of my first early experiences of learning how to drive a stick that was like one of the most traumatic driving experiences of my life. So uh, at one point I wanted to raise and I was uh, looking for ways that I could get more, um, be, be more productive at work. So I wanted to learn how to drive a stick and I asked my stepdad to show me how to drive a stick. And the work truck had that same setup. And so he one time let me kind of put around the parking lot. I, said, I, had, I already knew how to drive. But he let me you know, drive around the parking lot practicing, you know, starting, stopping with a stick. And uh, he let me drive the whole work truck home. And that was it. Well, then two weeks later, they come to work. And they needed somebody to drive a stick in a really bad way. And there was really no one else that could do it. And so I find myself forced into driving this big old truck. Uh, it was a giant flatbed. And it was loaded down with metal. And it was just, you know, really big truck, really heavy truck. And um, I had to, to learn how to drive it really quick and drive across town. And so this was like the worst, one of the worst driving experiences of my life because I really wasn't ready for something like this. And then not, not only that, um, the, the truck was big and heavy and overloaded, but visibility was really bad. It was just pouring down rain. Couldn't really see the, the road signs, what they said, or things like that. And so um, I couldn't see. Um, didn't have the experience. Uh, I was going to drive across Portland in rush hour traffic at like the worst time of the day that you could drive. And even worse than that, my stepdad, who is like a super aggressive driver, you know, I'd have to catch up with him because if I didn't stay up with him, then I would lose him and I wouldn't know how to get there. Like I didn't know where I was going. And so it was just really stressful to follow him and to, to I mean, I probably broke a dozen traffic laws just so I didn't lose him because he would he would just do that you know he would he was just uh, not a very ethical driver 
And in Portland, you really have to kind of be aggressive. You're not going to get anywhere. So, uh, so I had this experience of just trying to follow after this truck that I could barely see um, through this 45-minute drive across the worst part of Portland to get to the job site. And, and I got there. You know, I did what it took. I, what I had to do. Uh, I didn't have a cell phone or anything if I got lost, so I just had to do it, and, and I got there. And I think sometimes in, as we follow Jesus, we, we think like it's, it's like following that truck a little bit. Like, like Jesus is just maybe going to leave us in the dust. You know, if we don't do everything it takes to, to keep up, that he is not really a shepherd who's going to lead us, that he might just kind of abandon us, that he might just leave us behind. And so, um, as, I, uh, as I thought about this experience, and I thought about how sometimes it feels like when you're following God, it, it, it's so mysterious. Like, you don't always know where you're going. You don't always know the conditions. Uh, you don't always know what the big plan is. And sometimes it's way faster than you would like it to be. Sometimes we have no, no clue as to where we're going. And secretly, I think many of us, we fear that we're going to be left behind. But if we don't uh, if we slip up a little bit, that God will just kind of abandon us as he hurdles off to wherever he's going without us. And I think for many people, it's hard to trust in the goodness of God. To, to trust in the goodness of God when many of us have experienced so many broken things in our world. So many things that have hurt us. And, and often, uh, it's hard to trust God because the places that God is leading us isn't often the place that the desires of our heart want us to go. It looks a little different than where we would want to go, where we would want to be led. It looks like a, a foreign, foreign place. At Silverton Friends, uh, I helped out a lot with the youth group, and uh, there's a, a Christian camp out there. And there's a lot of uh, kind of outdoor ministries in this area of Silverton, Oregon. Uh, one time, we took a bunch of kids out to this horse ranch that was like one of those horse ranches where they do like animal psychotherapy. Like Christian animal psychology. So you got like abused kids that are uh, learning how to build this relationship with a horse. And you've got these abused horses that have been rescued from um, you know, horrible situations. And, and so uh, we were able to ride these horses across this, this big trail. And it was a lot of fun. But because I was the big strong guy, they, they wanted me to have like the problem horse. So it's this, this horse that. Um, it was, it was so starved, it was so um, neglected, that it would just eat like pine needles off a branch at the walk by. I mean, anything that was green, anything that got near this horse, it would, it would try to go over this tree and eat the tree. It just, it, it was just broken, you know, and I had to fight the horse the whole way to try to get, uh, to keep it moving, to keep up with everybody else. Um, it was the whole, the whole job was just to try to keep the horse's head pointed away from seeing anything that was green, which was pretty hard to do in Oregon in a forest, right? I mean, this was a pretty frustrating experience. I think as we, as we follow God, though, sometimes we, we're like that horse where we're, we're afraid that there's not going to be, like, grass for us when we follow God. That we're not going to get the sustenance that we need. That where God's leading us might not be a place that we can... Uh, fill ourselves on the good things of God. And, and many of us, I think, struggle and stumble along the way. Um, we, we, we can't wait for the good things of God, so we just we find these substitutes along the way. We, we're willing to, to fall into temptation when it comes our way, to, to stumble, to eat things that aren't good for us, whatever is presented before us, to keep, um, to keep stumbling and, and not trusting God, not trusting in the goodness of God to take us somewhere that's worth going. Jesus said that I am the good shepherd. And before I unpack a little bit about what that means, I want to acknowledge that this is a radical statement. It's a radical statement not only about who God is and how God is, but about who we are and how we are in relationship to God. For many of us who are new to the faith, it's, it's easy to see God as kind of a distant, aloof, maybe slightly uncaring kind of deity. Someone who's far off and mysterious, not someone that we can know, know at the level of knowing the voice of God. But an understanding of God as shepherd radically challenges this at every level. It paints a picture of God who is intimate and near and concrete, the kind, of, kind of God that you can reach out and touch along the journey. It speaks of a God who is being with us, who comes to be where we are, and speaks of him patiently leading us on 
to the next part of our journey, not like that truck that might abandon us that we can't keep up. Thomas Kelly uh, was a great Quaker mystic, and he writes in his, in his book about this frustrating experience with the church. And I want to read this kind of extended quote that he says that I think is very prudent to not just his time in the 1930s, but our time as well. He writes, this is something wholly different from mild, conventional religion with which, with respectable skirts held back by dainty fingers, anxiously tries to fish the world out of the mud hole of its own selfishness. Our churches, our meeting houses are full of such respectable and amiable people. We have plenty of Quakers to follow God the first half of the way. And many of us have become as mildly and as conventionally religious as the church folk of three centuries ago, against whose mildness, mildness and mediocrity and passionlessness, George Fox and his followers flung themselves out with the passion of a glorious new discovery and with all the energy of dedicated lives. And he goes on to say that in some says William James, religion exists as a dull habit, in others as an acute fever. Religion as a dull habit is not that for which Christ lived and died. I think uh, the picture that we have of Jesus in the incarnation is the, 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 of a God who comes down to be with us where we are, who's willing to, to take on flesh, to leave the throne of heaven, to come and, and come into the, the messiness of the world. The, the messiness and smelliness of a stable. And, 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 and a God who would do this for our sake. And following our shepherd Messiah is and can be a nitty gritty kind of business. One with plenty of room for the messiness of real life. Um, there's no place for respectable skirts held back by dainty fingers, anxiously trying to fish the world out of the mud bowl of its own selfishness. That's not the role of the church. It's not the role of a church that follows a shepherd. Let's never forget how the blood of Jesus mingled with the dirt as it, as it fell beneath the cross. How as we were washed clean, Christ's blood cleansed us and that, that blood got dirty. It absorbed the filth of us and, and made us clean. And so Jesus as a shepherd is, is a picture of God who gets dirty alongside us. How he is sharing the same journey with us and sharing the same dusty path of freedom that he's calling us to walk. It's what following him means, that we're going to be in the same place on the same journey, walking through the same mud holes that come our way. In Christian leadership, uh, the ultimate aim isn't to, to arrive at some place, it's to, to be remade in the image and likeness of Jesus, to be growing not in our image, but in his image, in all its fullness. Shepherding in the ancient Near Eastern model uh, was a model of servant leadership. It describes uh, Jesus and people like King David, and it's a form of leadership that's expressed in daily actions, daily uh, love and journey. And the shepherd leader uh, lives among the sheep, and they know his voice. And the sheep can trust their shepherd to make good decisions. They can trust that their shepherd is leading them in places that are good, places that are worth going. And they can see the character of their shepherd with their own eyes. It's a, an intimate community where you can't just put on a mask and pretend that everything's okay. At Berkeley College, uh, I went on a, a, as a pastoral ministry class. They took us on a field trip out to a sheep farm. And um, it, was, it was a really interesting uh, experience to do that. And as a child, I often imagined at various points that it what it would be like to turn myself into an animal if I could be a an eagle, you know, or a wolf or some, some kind of an animal that could do something amazing. Could just spend the day as an animal. And many of us, when we would want to, to turn into an animal or describe ourselves in, as an animal, none of us would think about wanting to become a sheep for a day. You know, we might want, want to be a graceful swan or a powerful eagle. But very few of us would ever want to spend the day as a dirty, filthy, smelly sheep. And on the trip, it became very apparent right away that, that this biblical metaphor of, of being a sheep is not a flattering image. It's not uh, an image that, that flatters our egos and makes us think about how wonderful it is that God made us. And the man who ran the sheep farm was not a Christian, but even he could see the value of showing us this side because he, he was fully aware of this 
deep connection between how people are and how sheep work. You can see the benefit of people like uh, future pastors that were coming up in this class of, of showing them a little bit about what it means to walk in his shoes, to, to see people in all their messiness and filth for who they were, the good and the bad, and just uh, accept it and, and try to make a difference in a day-to-day -day kind of relationship. And so I can see that sheep were not smart. They were not self-reliant. You know, they were kind of dumb animals. They were stubborn and needy. And there's nothing quite as hopeless as a little baby sheep. I saw a little sheep along the way just making its um, you know, bad noise, just completely helpless, dirty, filthy, laying there. Um, it's not a flattering image. And I think uh, that he's right, that sheep represent all that's bad about humanity and all that's good about humanity in, in kind of equal measure. You know, the, the, the man who was the shepherd taught us about how sheep can sometimes be terrible parents who don't take care of their own children. And how sometimes they can just get in a fight and, and kick each other to death. And he, but he also talked about how they can demonstrate some of the beautiful warmth that you have of seeing a, a sheep that's not being raised properly, that's not being cared for, and just adopt it as their own and raise it up as their own kid. So one thing I left there with was um, an, an earnest desire to, to think about Jesus as my shepherd, to think about my utter need for him and the utter need in our world for servant leadership like that. Leadership that comes and picks us up and dusts us off and brings us a little further than we would have wanted to go. So as controversial as the biblical metaphor of, of a sheep is, you know, as people who don't want to be considered sheep, we don't want to think of ourselves as sheep, it's undeniable that this imagery of sheep and shepherd in the ancient Near East, it, it paints a portrait of things like grace, warmth, the messiness of real life, the real depth of relationship in a tight community where you can't put on a mask and pretend you're someone other than you are. There's a closeness here that's almost like family. The Hebrew word most commonly used for shepherd is ra'ah, and it's often used in ways to express uh, actions like feeding and tending and ruling and teaching. And it's not only used in the context of sheep, it's also used many times in the context of, of leading people. King David is described as a king who functioned like a shepherd. And it can be associated with being a companion or various other things. And the Greek word associated with that is poimen. And it's used to speak of one to whose care and control that we might commit ourselves, whose precepts that we would follow. And it conveys many roles in the New Testament like presiding officer or manager or director of an assembly. It describes kings and princes. It even describes Christ as the head of the church. And Jesus saw in people the need for guidance, the need to, to have a shepherd lead them, to walk with them, to have compassion on them and pull them out of the mess that they had made and, and to get them back on the right path. Jesus' heart was broken with compassion for people that were wandering aimlessly in their sins and didn't know how to get out of the mess that they had made. I think these uh, definitions of Greek and Hebrew words can be uh, kind of misleading sometimes. You know, if we don't understand the cultural context that these terms and, and things originated. The, the actual work of an ancient Near Eastern shepherd was, according to like the dictionary, is to watch enemies trying to, to watch for enemies trying to attack the sheep, to defend the sheep from attackers, to heal the wounded and sick sheep, to find and save lost or trapped sheep, to love them, sharing their lives, and so earning their trust. And so Jesus is the Good Shepherd, the true Messiah, as I talked about last week, about how different people would, would try to be, uh, claim to be the Messiah. They try to raise being a shepherd as simply something that he had to do, like a job that he could just clock out of, you know, at quitting time and, and leave for the night. He didn't think about his sheep like a, a modern rancher might look at numbers, you know, tagged to the ear of a cow that, that are just a number at hand. That was not the kind of relationship that a shepherd would have with their sheep. Jesus doesn't see his sheep as his property. He sees us as people in need who face real dangers as we live our lives. He will never leave us or forsake us. He will never sacrifice us for his own sake but is willing to love us to the last breath, to the last drop even of his own blood. And Jesus knows his sheep and they know him deeply. 
He knows us and we can know him, that Jesus says in this passage, is deeply in a, in a similar way that Jesus and his relationship with the Father function. That we can have that kind of relationship with Jesus, that close, that tight knit. We have access to God at that level. So Jesus' vision isn't just limited to us, though, and, and the people around us, the people who already hear his voice, the people who already know God. He has other sheep out there, other people that he's reaching out to, other people that he might stop the whole trip for, just to scoop up and, and bring into the fold to be with us. And so it's not just us who already know God that God cares about. There's only really one flock and one shepherd but it's a lot bigger than we would probably want to make it. And Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. I spoke a little bit last week about the different false uh, messiahs of Jesus' day coming up to and after him, and how there were these people who, who, who wanted that status of messiah. They wanted to bring about the liberation of their people so badly that they were willing to raise up armies, to pretend to be the Messiah, to raise up armies and try to fight off the Romans and, and kind of enact their vision of the kingdom of God. And I want to point out that this idea of Jesus as a suffering servant or a suffering servant Messiah was not something that was expected in, in the Jewish world before Jesus came. No one expected a Messiah who would lay down his life for them. In fact, most of these people, they wanted to gather up followers and they wanted them to lay down their lives they wanted sheep, uh, they wanted soldiers, not sheep. They expected that they, these people would be used as a tool to bring about this kingdom that they wanted. And what makes Jesus so different is that he showed the world sacrificial love. He showed the ultimate loving sacrifice. Not only did Jesus lay down his life for us, but he took it back up for us as well. He laid it all down and he tasted the fullness of death. I mean, that's such a a theological mystery that God would die for us. And, and yet, God raised him from the dead, and he ushered in life, and he showed us that his claims of being the Messiah were true. And more than this, he makes room for our responses. He makes room for people like these Pharisees in the passage to question whether this person really comes from God, whether this person perhaps is possessed by a demon or has lost their mind. He gives room for them to wrestle with to speculate about his sanity. You know, I think that's a part of the process of coming to terms with who Jesus is. We have to recognize, you know, hey, is this, as C.S. Lewis puts it, is this, a, a, is this liar, lunatic, or Lord? Is this someone worth following? Jesus gives space for people to do that here. And I think we, we need to, to also give that space for people to question, space for people to wonder, is this Jesus guy really worth following? And we each have a response to make for ourselves, but we also uh, get a look around for other people, people who might be interested in hearing more, people who might be considering following Jesus, and stop and wait for them, to wait for them to make their decision, to come and, and decide to join us as a sheep, or if they want to keep pretending that they're doing something else. And so we recognize that we are sheep, they are sheep, that we're not any better than these people who haven't been walking with Jesus very long. If we seem healthier and more put together than them, it's only because of the benefits of following our Savior, walking with our shepherd a little bit longer and being strengthened by that experience. But the main difference between us as sheep and people who are still out there as sheep is that we are actually trying to be like our shepherd. We're trying to be transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. And Jesus' shepherd's heart was broken for people lost in their sins, people out there flailing and, and confused and lost. And, and, and God wants our hearts to also be broken for people who, who come to him in similar circumstances. And so the question that, that I want to leave us here with today is, do we have room for, in our flock for new people that God will bring? You know, do we have patience with our shepherd who might just stop the whole thing to scoop up a sheep and dust it off and clean it up and keep moving along on the path to freedom. Are we willing to, to welcome new people into our fold? Even the ones who still smell a little bit like sheep. The ones that might slow us down. The ones that Jesus wants to, to stop and dawdle over like he stopped and dawdled over us when we came. 
There's an old saying that the church is supposed to be more like a hospital for sinners than a hotel for saints. And I think that's a pretty accurate picture of what it means to be a sheep of God, to have Jesus be our shepherd, to accept that what it means at a, at a very deep level. You know, we all want to be swans. You know, we want to hurry up and get this whole big journey over with. We just want to arrive on the other side. We want to get to heaven and all its glory and just shortcut to that. No, we don't want to be reminded that we're sheep. We don't want to walk a dusty road through a broken world, but that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. We can all gather around and circle the wagons, and we can put on masks and pretend that we're a bunch of swans, that we have everything figured out, or we can get real. We can join God in what he's doing out there in the dust and the dirt and the sheep pies of this world, and we can join with him in that, in rescuing another one like us can join him in a shared life together. So we're going to go into a time of open worship. It's a time of waiting for the Lord to, to speak to us, to move. If you feel that God has a message or that he wants to speak through you to the congregation, feel free to stand and a microphone will be brought to you. Um, it's okay just to sit in silence and wait for God's presence and experience God in intimate communion, but um, just be obedient in this time. Just be faithful to whatever spirits leading you to do.